Thank you all so much for being here this evening. Um, welcome to Allendale United Methodist Church. Um, my name is Kelsey. I am the events coordinator at Tom Below Books, and on behalf of Allendale, Florida Humanities, and Tom Below Books, we'd like to thank you all so much for being here on um, a very auspicious evening, the 60th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. Um, thank you all for being for being here to commemorate this with us. We are so honored to be joined by the panel that we are joined by. And um, before I call up Dr. Uh, Nasheed Maduin from Florida Humanities to say a few words, I'd just like to point out restrooms are gonna be on both ends over here. We have um, men's restrooms and women's restrooms on both sides over here. And also in the back, um, we have books for sale uh, brought by Tom Below Books, um, specifically Once Upon a Time in Florida, which is the Florida Humanities Anthology, which Beverly and Bill, uh, two of our panelists here this evening, are both featured in. Um, so I would like to say a very, very big thank you to, especially to Allendale and to Cameron over here, who's helping out with the sound and everything. Please give a round of applause to Allendale. They do amazing work in the community. We've done um, events here, uh, multiple events here this year, and they're always such a welcoming and warm space for us, so we're, we're very happy to be here. And we hope that you will visit us at Tom Below Books down in the Grand Central District um, very soon. And also uh, support the Florida Humanities because they're doing some incredible work here in our community as well. So I'm going to call up the Executive Director of the Florida Humanities, Dr. Nasheed Majuan. Good evening, everyone. All right. Thank you so much for coming out this evening, and thank you, Allendale United Methodist Church, for this wonderful, beautiful place for our talk this evening. And thank, to our, thank you to our friends at Tumalo Books, our partners in literature here in St. Pete. I am Nasheed Madewan, the Executive Director of Florida Humanities. We are a nonprofit organization that serves that serves the, as a statewide affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. We just marked our 50th year, and our work is primarily focused on sharing the stories of Florida history, heritage, cultures, literature, music, cuisine, and all the ways that connect us as humans and learn from each other as neighbors. We have many venues and avenues that we use to do that, such as our award-winning magazine form, our digital resource, Florida Stories, which offers you a dynamic way to explore towns and cities across the state through virtual tours. We also have our wonderful speakers program, Florida Talks, that brings the brightest scholars, authors, and historians to your communities. And last but certainly not least, we fulfill our mission through our grant making. We support our state's cultural nonprofit organizations, libraries, museums, public institutions by funding their humanity-based pro programs and initiatives, such as exhibitions, film and book festivals, cultural ce celebrations, documentaries, podcasts, community conversations like tonight, and the like. To learn more about our work and our impact, please check out our website floridahumanities.org, and also stop by our table to talk to my colleagues, Mara, Stephanie, and LaShonda. Get a free copy of our forum magazine and learn about how to stay in touch with us and support our organization through membership. And I will say there is a card on your seat we would like to have you complete at the end of the program so that we can learn more about what you want to hear from us. Okay, so let's get started. Our moderator tonight is Emerald Morrow. Emerald is an award-winning investigative reporter and fill-in anchor for WTSP-TV 10, Tampa Bay, since 2014. Her work focuses on promoting understanding, un uncovering wrongs, and inspiring change, particularly in marginalized communities. She has a laundry list of accolades from Emmy Awards to top honors from journalism associations. We are very honored to have her navigating this conversation, and I'll turn it over to Emerald to introduce our incredible panel. Enjoy the evening, everyone. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, wonderful. Before we get started, I just want to say it's wonderful to be here with you all tonight. And since we are in the church, I'm going to have to go back to where I came from in the Baptist Church of St. Louis, Missouri. I want everybody to turn to their neighbor and say, neighbor. 
I'm so glad to be here tonight. <laughs> All right, <laughs> good job. <laughs> yes, it is truly an honor to be here with you tonight. And it is in large part because of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that I am sitting before you tonight. This landmark legislation forbade segregation in public places. It helped push integration in public schools and made it illegal for employers to discriminate based on the color of one's skin, among other things. But getting here, of course, was not easy. In fact, it was painful. It was bloody. In some cases, it was deadly. And tonight, we will revisit the push, the struggle, and the triumph for black Americans, a triumph made possible by a coalition of all colors, a coalition demanding freedom for our nation. So as we prepare to reflect on 60 years of the Civil Rights Act, and before we introduce our panel of distinguished guests, I want to leave you with this quote from the late and great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who, of course, championed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It may be true that morality cannot be legislated, but behavior can be regulated. It may be true that the law cannot change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless. It may be true that the law can't make a man love me, but it can restrain him from lynching me. And I think that's pretty important also. So while the law may not change the hearts of men, it does change the habits of men. And when you change the habits of men, pretty soon the attitudes and the hearts will be changed. And so there is a need for strong legislation constantly to grapple with the problems we face. Now let's introduce our guests. Raymond Arsenault is the John Hope Franklin Professor of Southern History Emeritus at the University of South Florida and is one of the nation's leading civil rights historians and the author of several widely acclaimed and prize-winning books. His most recent book published this year, January 2024, is John Lewis, In Search of the Beloved Community. The 2011 PBS American Experience documentary Freedom, Ride, Freedom Riders, based on his book, won three Emmys and a George Peabody Award. Absolutely incredible. Let's give him a round of applause. Next on the stage, we have Mr. Bill Maxwell, and he wrote a twice-weekly syndicated column and editorials for the St. Petersburg Times from 1994 to 2009 and monthly through 2019. He also taught journalism and English for 18 years in Florida colleges and universities and founded Role Models Today Foundation to support journalism students. I certainly appreciate that as a journalist. <laughs> At various times from 2013 to 2017, he taught writing at St. Petersburg College and Miami-Dade College while writing weekly articles and columns for the National Park Service in Everglades National Park Centennial. Please, let's give a round of applause to Bill Maxwell. And last but certainly not least on the stage, we have Ms. Beverly Coyle, who is a fifth generation Floridian, and her critically acclaimed novels are all set right here in Florida. Her novel, In Troubled Waters, is a story of racial conflict based on a personal family history. Beverly was asked to write about her childhood memories of growing up under Florida's memorably harsh Jim Crow laws for the 1993 issue of Florida Humanities Forum magazine. She and fellow panelist Bill Maxwell then co-wrote the play Parallel Lives, which premiered at American Stage Theater in 2003. Round of applause for Beverly. I truly feel so lucky just to be here tonight to sit next to people who have such wonderful stories and it is just so important for us to share those stories and be here and learn from all of the, the great things that they've done. It's just truly inspiring so I hope you enjoy tonight's talk. Our first question tonight will go to Mr. Raymond Arsenault. 
The Civil Rights Act was a hallmark piece of legislation that banned discrimination in public places and did all the things that we kind of talked about in the beginning. It was also called the most sweeping legislation since Reconstruction. Set the scene for us on what was happening in America in 1964 and what were the biggest challenges to getting this act passed? Well, I think I'd probably have to go way back before 1964 to try to give you some, some context. Uh, I was thinking as we get the introductions that once upon a time in Florida is a nice way of uh, just saying once, a time, once upon a time in Florida there was a repressive, all-encompassing Jim Crow system which controlled everybody's lives and uh, which Beverly and Bill and I all grew up with. Uh, that was the state of affairs before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, there had been serious and significant changes since the early 20th century. Uh, most historians see the period r roughly 1910 to 1930 as kind of the low point uh, of American race relations, that when, when the Jim Crow system of segregation was at its, uh, at its peak. And there were some victories along the way to try to sort of whittle away at that. Uh, ever since the NAACP was founded in, in, in 1909, and uh, they've, start, they've started a kind of a legal struggle against lynching and against forms of, forms of Jim Crow. Uh, starting in the 1930s with the New Deal, there's, there's some change. Franklin Roosevelt had his black cabinet led by Mary McLeod Bethune, a Floridian. Um, and uh, over the years, the Supreme Court liberalized, and so there were a series of decisions uh, Smith versus Allwright, which struck down the white primary system in 1944. Uh, Shelley versus Kramer in 1948, which made it illegal to enforce restrictive covenants so that you, you prevent you from selling your home to an African American or to other m members of other minority groups. And of course, the Brown decision of 1954, uh, which is seen as a great, as a great landmark. Uh, but I think the Civil Rights Act of 1964, like the Brown decision, has a certain irony built into it. Uh, it, it raised expectations, as the Brown decision did, uh, the notion that African Americans might someday have full citizenship, be treated decently, have a, have a full chance in the world to fulfill themselves. Uh, but the reality was that after the Brown decisions of 1954 and 55, there was almost no progress, at least in the Deep South, on school desegregation. It wasn't until the late 1960s, really 1971 in this county, before there was any real, real integration. So there was a sense that maybe we can't depend on the courts to free us. And in a, in a, in a sense, I think that sort of gave license to the nonviolent direct action movement, taking the struggle out of the courtroom and into the streets. And that's, of course, what happened beginning with the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955-56 with the sit-ins of 1960, the Freedom Rides of 1961, um, and on and on into the, the full kind of movement, the kind of movement culture emerged in the early 1960s of expecting that somehow African Americans could successfully fight their way uh, towards some, at least a piece of, of, the, of the American dream. Um, so there, I think there was an expectation that someday there would be something like the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But it was very hard slogging because just as blacks um, improved their, their situation, there was a tremendous backlash, what we call the rise of massive resistance. The, the moderate politicians of certain parts of the South sort of disappeared in the late 50s and early 60s. And of course, I'm sure you all know about the rise of the, a new generation of racial demagogues, George Wallace, Lester Maddox, Ross Barnett, Strom Thurmond, others. Um, so uh, when was this going to come? I mean, when when, when we, can we get something like the Civil Rights Act? Well, the Kennedy administration initially had very little interest in it. And it was really the great victory of Martin Luther King and the movement in Birmingham in the spring of 1963 that basically pushes the Kennedy administration uh, way ahead of its schedule to release a, a comprehensive Civil Rights Act. But of course, John Kennedy is assassinated in November of 1963, and it's left to Lyndon Johnson. And I think at first, a lot of uh, civil rights advocates were in despair. They, they never thought that Lyndon Johnson would ever 
uh, follow through with the, the promise of that Civil Rights Act. But in fact, he did. Uh, it's one of the great kind of puzzles of American history of how this kind of uh, sharpster politician was famous for twisting arms and for kind of maybe bending the truth a bit and uh, even stuffing a few ballot boxes in Texas to get elected uh, could, could lead this crusade for the, for the, for the bill. Um, and it's really, um, I think, uh, the moment that, that happens that he's able to use the martyred president. Even though John Kennedy was not a great proponent of civil rights, Johnson turned him into a kind of martyred figure. And, but it was, even with that, it was incredibly difficult to get this law through. Uh, it, it, it was touch and go. There were, there were filibusters for one, one of them for 75 days, some of the longest filibusters in the Senate. So the House passed this bill uh, in February of 1964, but the Senate didn't do it until the end of June. That's why we're, of course, celebrating this on July 2nd. It took that long. They had, they had to alter it somewhat. They had to water it down a little bit, not as bad as the previous civil rights laws of 1957 and 1960. Um, but, uh, I think there was a kind of holding the breath feeling of, is this really what it appears to be? Striking down segregation in public accommodations and in, in public places. And uh, just one final thing. I think people were joyous. I mean, Martin Luther King called it the second emancipation. A tremendous sense that now there, there was sort of great new potential for African Americans to live uh, decent lives. Um, but in fact, they discovered quite early on uh, that uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 didn't solve all of their problems by any means. It didn't really attack economic inequality. It didn't at attack job discrimination, for the most part, uh, uh, all kinds of things in terms of, uh, of inadequate health care and, and just a general uh, kind of shabby treatment. And so it, it, it sets the stage for a kind of disillusionment which sets in. Uh, in, in the, in the mid-1960s. And so it's, it's like a lot of things. It's sort of, is the glass half full or half empty? You know, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of an ironic sense, but it's still a great, a great thing to celebrate. I think it's wonderful that we're here tonight to, to mark the 60, 60 years. And uh, um, it's something we all need to know about, the history of, of this milestone event. Absolutely, 100%. And one thing, a follow-up question I would like to ask you as it relates to that is Florida is often forgotten when it comes to the civil rights movement. It's like an overlooked place in history. People don't think of Florida and associate that with civil rights. Dr. King spent time here in St. Augustine and was here in St. Augustine just like days before President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act into law. So can you just talk about Florida's role in particularly St. Augustine in the Civil Rights Act of 1964? Well, oftentimes in the history of the Civil Rights Movement, St. Augustine is largely overlooked and forgotten. But in fact, it's one of the great kind of generating points for the coalition that emerged to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Without St. Augustine, it would have been much, much more difficult. Uh, the, uh, I'm sure many of you have know the, the basics of what happened in St. Augustine. It was a incredibly ugly situation. There were several attempts to kill Dr. King. Um, uh, it's a miracle he survived. Uh, there were mass marches. The, the, the Ku Klux Klan was actually deputized as the sheriff's deputies. That's how bad it was in St. Augustine in 1964. Uh, and, uh, uh, it, it, but it, I think it convinced a lot of people that we've got to do something, something uh, special to, to somehow break the chain of, of this uh, awful tradition of, of interracial violence and, 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 and repression. So Florida pay, played a big role, no question about it. Absolutely, thank you. Mr. Maxwell, the racial climate of Florida and the demonstrations of the early 1960s, particularly in St. Augustine, as we just heard, they played a huge role in setting the stage for the Civil Rights Act. Now you said in your article, Raised with Love, Schooled in Cruel Realities, that quote, the dynamism of the movement convinced me that my generation of college students will eliminate racial injustice in the United States and I want to be a part of it. Now in that same article you tell a story about an effort to register to vote in northern Florida and a harrowing tale of coming face to face with Sheriff Willis McCall. Tell us more about that experience and why you risked your safety to challenge this system. 
<clears throat> well, first, um, in 1964, um, I had never been around uh, any young white people, never. So I go to Marshall, Texas, to Wiley College as a freshman, and I meet uh, young, young white people. And most of those young white people are beatniks and hippies. Uh, if you don't know anything about hippies, uh, they were full of love and uh, real love. Um, and I got a chance to actually be around white kids for the first time. And they, were, they became my friends. And so I, I assumed, and many of us did assume, that these young people were going to help us change things. And, and they did. And I was in Marshall, Texas, very racist. Um, but we had white kids there who became our friends. And it gave us hope. We thought that the country would change. And so I wanted to be a part of that. So when SCOC and SNCC sent people to our campus to organize us and ask us to travel and get people registered to vote, uh, we decided that, I decided that was something that I wanted to do. And we were taught then that getting people registered to vote was the future. And we certainly believed it. And back then, um, I learned quickly that in, in the South, I, I was sent to uh, Mississippi, Alabama. And we learned quickly that um, white people did not want us to, to, to vote, to register. And I saw the worst violence I've seen in my life was in um, uh, Mississippi and Alabama, and then later on in Florida, St. Augustine, as a matter of fact. Um, so we uh, had a very hard time getting people registered to vote. I worked for four years as a volunteer and I can personally say that I maybe have got maybe 20 people registered to vote in three states. And the main reason was fear. They would not go to the courthouse to do so. And when you did get there, there was a literacy test that you could never pass. You know, who the hell knew what uh, the Constitution said verbatim? Um, the white folks who got to vote didn't know either, but they registered and we did not. And so when I came to Florida uh, to, as part of the uh, movement, we went to uh, Lake County, first of all. Uh, and Lake County uh, was the home of Willis McCall, Caboose McCall. And um, better you know who Caboose was. And so he, um, big white Stetson hat, uh, big cowboy boots, a big belt. And uh, he was a scary man to look at. And the. We knew, and we were in Lake County and Sumter County, and McCall had been in office since 1930, 30 something, and he stayed there until the until 1970s. Uh, so for those many years, this one man ruled that part of Florida. And I watched an, an uncle uh, almost get beat to death. Uh, I did watch him shoot uh, one black man who was down the street from where my mother lived. and so. Fear is what drove us. Uh, we, you woke up every morning, and this is no exaggeration, you woke up every morning knowing that McCall was somewhere. He did not need to be there to keep you in line. And that's one thing we learned. We learned to stay in our places in, in Lake County and in Sumter County. And so uh, I woke up every day wondering if it would be my last day. And one time I did come, well not just three times I came face to face. Uh, I, had, I was with two other um, uh, volunteers from up north. So they came and we were in uh, Tavares going to get people registered to vote. McCall stops us and of course I almost fainted to death right then to see this man. First thing I saw was that big white Stetson hat. He gets out of his car and the first thing he does is ask us, what are you niggers doing here? Well, uh, this nigger was there to uh, get people registered to vote. But once you saw McCall, you knew that your life wasn't worth anything. And so I don't know if you can, you can imagine waking up every day knowing that there's someone out there who will kill you. And you know, it did keep us in line. Uh, black men, whenever you heard that McCall was coming anywhere near your neighborhood, you ran and you ran for cover. And so, um, 
This is how it was in Florida, in that part of the state. What most people don't realize is that when they come to Florida, they went down the, the Gulf Coast or the Atlantic Coast. And Florida seemed pretty good. But once you go into the interior, it's still that way, by the way, the further you go inside Florida, the more racist it becomes. And back then, it was uh, you could take a knife and cut it. Uh, so fear was what drove life for us at that time. But as a, as a young person, having white friends with me, I really did think that we were going to change America. And uh, only until, I suppose, maybe when I was a uh, junior in, in college that I realized that that was a pipe dream, that we were actually spitting in the wind the whole time, that very little had changed and nothing would change, and very few people registered to vote. And I just, I'm going to just say one thing about, contempt, about now. Uh, I feel like I have actually entered uh, the 1960s again in the state of Florida. Uh, we have a governor now who hasn't done uh, anything but discount what happened to us. And it's an insult, and any, everybody who's in the state of Florida right now should be insulted by our return to Jim Crow. Uh, it's not under books anymore, and Beverly can talk about this. It was a law. We could not be together at the time. It was against the law for us to be together. Imagine that, that it's, it's illegal for people to be together. And that's the, that's the way it was uh, then. And McCall was, um, was uh, a, a, a terrorizing, uh, his name was terrorizing, not just his presence, but the way, you, the way they kept blacks in line then, we're gonna call caboose. And once you said that, um, uh, you knew that bad things were gonna happen. Thank you, Mr. Maxwell. And I just want to say a couple of things. Um, these stories, we want to acknowledge that they happened, that these things impacted people. And sometimes during that time, certain words were used. So I hope everybody understands that and he's just telling a, a personal story. And also that none of this reflects the views or anything of Florida Humanities. Um, Beverly Coyle, in your article, a sheltered 1950s childhood, then an awakening. you talking about growing up in a Methodist household and how that shaped your view on race relations. You said that your family and their respect for differences in race and creed grew out of education and a strong belief in one God who unites us all. You were a freshman at FSU when the Civil Rights Act passed. How did your family's values in a very segregated Florida push you to be active in the civil rights movement? FSU had a very strong Wesley Foundation. Uh, I was a white glove Methodist freshman and went straight to the Wesley Foundation, where the first sermon I heard was about Vietnam and how we were breaking the Geneva Accords. Uh, I took my gloves off. Um, <laughs> FSU, your question was, um, I was a freshman at FSU and... Yeah, how did your family values oh, shape well, your involvement in the civil rights there, movement? Yeah, there felt like there was an integration there. Um, I'm just going to back up. In the eighth grade in Fernandina Beach, my father had just taken a position there. He's brand new. I'm in the eighth grade. I come home and say, we don't have sixth period on Monday because the Lions Club Minstrel Show is going to perform at the junior high school. And I was excited, I didn't, and my father, this gets to a certain kind of fear in the white community. My father took it out on the messenger. He was just so furious that I was not gonna go to that show. I can remember my mother saying, well, isn't it kind of a talent show? No, no, no. Uh, and I learned about blackface. This, this story I told to Bill Maxwell when we were first getting to know each other, the Florida Humanities Council sent us a letter, we did not know each other, asking us to write about being the last of the Jim Crow high school kids. We went all the way through until we got into college, totally segregated. And when I told this story to Bill Maxwell and getting to know him, he first said, I said, I'm going to start, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about a minstrel show, and Bill's reaction was, wait, isn't that one bad idea we did not have to live through? <laughs> and when I said, well, as a matter of fact, in 1960, there was a minstrel shows in Fernandina Beach, and we became fast friends after that. 
<laughs> that was news to a newsman. Uh, and we went on, the, the Florida Humanities Council came up with a really wonderful idea. When our essays came in, the segregated lives we had lived, there was a wonderful woman there, um, Phyllis McEwen, who saw immediately that it was a play, that the two of us could go back and forth on the stage, almost like drama. The complete sheltered life that I lived was almost comic in the sense of true drama comic, seriously comic, and Bill's was the tragedy. Uh, and we were on the road for, once we scripted it, for 60 events, many of them in Florida, Bill going into towns that he really wasn't really sure that we should be there, Bartow and places like that. I want to thank the Humanities Council because it changed me to write about this. I thought I knew who I was with regard to race, but writing about it and meeting Bill, I'm going to suggest one other thing. The choir integrated at FSU. Florida a and three miles away, we would have the, their choir over to the Wesley Foundation and we would go there to their choir. And I wasn't in the choir, but I could go to the services. And I just want to say it was the experience of being together, not talking about civil rights, just being a choir, doing something as opposed to, it was a certain kind of activism that we weren't even aware of, which I think you can have in your lives now. Is there a way to be doing something with the other community? And the Humanities Council suggested that when we went into these cities, there would be a black women's club and a white women's club that would meet and host us. And they called this curious coalitions. Um, and with the hope that once we're together, like a think, think choir rather than learning and writing on the board and talking like I'm talking now, but doing something together. I had a job after I graduated from FSU where the civil rights movement was just so, how shall I say, exciting to be part of. Um, my first job between college and graduate student was at a, Bill, you'll, I don't think I've ever told you this story, it was at a, uh, an employment agency and I was put into the secretary, young women wanting to be secretaries. You call the company, the young woman's filled out a form and you try to match them, right? That's what an agency does. And I'd only been there about a week. One man that we had to, we had to uh, generate jobs and one man said, uh, by the way, because I was pitching one of our clients, uh, the country is equal opportunity, but I am not. And I realized it's the, the system can go all around these rules, as you know. Um, and on the forums, there was a little doodle. Remember, there was a little figure eight at the top. And my boss said, oh, that's just so you know that's a, that's a, black, that's a black woman. We need to know who are black. Because at that time, you're not supposed to put white and black on the form. And so here I am trying to do something that the civil rights bill uh, was transparently limited because you could do so many things that kept Jim, Jim Crow right, right there, right, right at our, everywhere you turned. Um, I think that's a great segue into coming back to Raymond Arsenault, hearing these stories from Beverly, hearing Bill's stories, and people who actually lived through this, I mean, yourself included. Yeah. 60 years after the Civil Rights Act, you talked a little bit earlier about the limitations of the bill. Can you go a little bit more into that and just give us a look at where we are today. I mean, even after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, you had the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and lots of other things along the way. So where are we now? What were the real limitations of that bill? 
Well, I think the Voting Rights Act of 1965 probably had a greater influence, actually, even than the Civil Rights Act of 1964, because it brought us, for the first time in American history, closer to a real democracy. You know, a tremendous increase in the percentage of African Americans registered to vote and actually voting, and of course that changed the attitudes of many white politicians in the South. Now they had to take that into account, and so even, even politicians like Strom Thurmond even George Wallace uh, would, had to worry about his image in the, in, in, in the black community. And then, of course, in 1968, there's this, another Civil Rights Act, which extends in terms of housing and, and education and voting and, um, and uh, employment law and all that sort of thing. Uh, and so the, the structure of Jim Crow, which I, I'm sure all of you realize that uh, cradle-to-grave segregation in the South was mandated by law, okay? Everything was controlled. Florida, for example, had a law that textbooks being used in black schools and textbooks being used in white schools could not be stored in the same warehouse. Think about that. That's how far the system went. Uh, it, 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 it controlled everything that you did. And I, I remember as moving to Florida uh, the day of the March on Washington, we're driving south. Just to, we were in Washington the night before, uh, and I w went swimming in this pool. My parents were tired. We'd driven down from Massachusetts, and there all the marchers were there. And uh, my parents went to the room to take a nap, you know, and I'm in the pool with black and white marchers. You never saw that in suburban Maryland in 1963. And I spent about two hours with these people saying, kid, if you want to see some real history, you come with us tomorrow. Don't drive to Florida, right? Come with us. You're going to, it's going to be incredible. Dr. King's going to be there. 250,000 people are going to be there. So of course, I'm just intoxicated. And I rush up to the room and tell my parents, we can't go to Florida tomorrow. We have got to go to this march. Uh, and of course, in the movie version, we would have gone to the march. <laughs> but in reality, I'm sitting there in the back seat, stewing uh, the, whole, the whole way down. And of course, when I found out what really happened you know, at the march, but it was uh, an incredible time, I think, uh, for, for, every, for all of us. Uh, actually, Beverly, Beverly and I went to the same high school. She left in, in fall of 1963, right? Four. Oh, in four. So we did have a year overlap. Yeah, we did. Yeah, but wow. you were younger. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Uh, we met in Clearwater a couple years later, but uh, anyway, um, here I am, this kid from Cape Cod, Massachusetts. I'd lived in Florida before, but we moved back, as I said, in August of 63, and I, you know, I'm trying to fit in, not, not, not easy to do. Uh, so civil rights agitation was in the air, everybody was tense. Uh, the town, uh, Fernandina Beach on Amelia Island was about 35% black, total cradle-to-grave segregation. Absolute. The school didn't desegregate until 1967. So uh, November 22nd, uh, I'm in the principal's office and I learn that President Kennedy had been killed. And we got out at 2 o'clock. He died exactly 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Um, and I'm, I'm walking down the hallway uh, to go back to class. The, the, the bell rang. All these kids came out, rushing out, and they are just cheering just cheering because, I mean, I think many of them probably felt ashamed later, but their initial reaction was, John Kennedy is dead. We, don't, we will not have to go to school with black people. That's how they read it. Uh, and I, I, I have to tell you, I've never felt so alone in my life as I did that moment, hearing those cheers and the jeers and, and uh, uh, I, I, I just, just, just shook me to, to, the, to the bone. This wasn't all that long ago. I mean, these stories and the reason that we have Beverly and Bill and even Raymond here is to kind of illustrate that these are things that people among us lived and endured and dealt with um, to both Bill and Beverly. Uh, when you look back over the 60 years, how far do you all feel we have come? And how much further do we need to go? I know that's kind of a classic question, but I think you all have such unique perspective to answer that? Well, uh, for fear of being a pessimist, 
and a cynic, <clears throat> uh, all around cynic. I've got to say that um, uh, I learned real early that I was part of a, of a victim class, and that there was a there were a perpetrator there was a perpetrator class out there, and they were white. And um, guess what? Uh, I don't feel much different now. Um, and I, I really shouldn't say this, but I'm going to attempt it. Unless you, uh, uh, we, we, have a, we have a governor who doesn't want you all, your kids, to know that we really do have a perpetrator class and a victim class. And uh, I, I grew up knowing that, acutely knowing it. And um, I felt good for a while with the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, other things that came along, I, I said, well, maybe there is um, something going on. And when we hit the road doing Parallel Lives and we got people together, these curious coalitions, groups of people who would never meet uh, any other way, uh, the council, we call it council still back then, were able to get people together who would never talk to each other. And they got together, tonight there are no blacks here, I wish there were. Because again, it would be a good coalition of, of, of people. But um, uh, how far do I think we've come? Um, I thought for a while we had come a long way, but I think we have uh, regressed, and I think that it's, it's even worse now uh, because of uh, you know we have a different way to communicate. You know, you sit with your thumbs and you send people uh, incendiary stuff, and you can gather people together, and bad things happen. So I see a long road ahead of us. I see that we've got to go back all over again and do things. People right now have a very hard time voting, registering to vote in our state of Florida, other places in the South. And in fact, some of the Midwestern states are surprising to me. So to, to answer your question, um, um, I think we have came a long way, but I think we gave it up uh, in many places. And I don't see it getting back again because I see very bad people Get neglected right now. I don't know how we are doing that, but we're doing it. We're electing some very, you have a Supreme Court that uh, going to send us back even further. So um, that's my pessimism. Just a little image of myself, the last voting, <coughs> presidential voting. I had a, a, a early, what did, <laughs> early voting form. And I knew I wasn't going to put it in my post box outside with the flag up. Something had happened to it. I even worried about taking it to the post office. Something had happened to it. Because early voters were liberals in people's minds. So I went to the big box, right, with the big pull down thing and slam. But all around it were people waiting to intimidate us from doing that. They were scary people around that box. Um, and that was just, what, four years ago? <laughs> uh, so I wanted to give a, just a little moment that surprised Bill and me when we were on the road. My father had another appointment down in Venice Nokomis. And Bill told me, you know, that he worked with, he, he, from time to time worked with his parents. And they could always stop in a corner where this Dairy Queen was. And I knew exactly where that Dairy Queen was. And that this man let black children come right up to the window and buy ice cream. And we both looked at each other and we cried. <laughs> we cried at the, at, the, at the thought of us both being at this same Dairy Queen. And his experience was so positive that because there was this one man that, you know. I wanted to say something about my father's jumping on me. I didn't finish that moment. What I figured out later as an adult was how afraid he was. He was taking it out on the messenger, bawling me out for wanting to go to a minstrel show and I didn't know anything about. That was his fear. What is he going to do about this as the Methodist minister in this new town? and the Lions Club is putting on minstrel shows. You know, what, I think that's what was in him, and I think white people need to understand where that fear is in all of us. It can happen just like that. What am I gonna do? 
we feel paralyzed. Um, and I think if we can address that fear in ourselves, not just the fear in the black community, we have a different kind of fear of passivity, not doing enough, not knowing, how, thinking we don't know how to do enough. So you remember that moment. <laughs> Yeah, I'd just like to jump in here for a second. Um, I certainly understand Bill's pessimism, and uh, it's very real, and I've heard him talk about this before, and I think I, I, I agree with it to a large extent, but think about this meeting tonight, where we are, in Allendale Methodist Church. Um, this church was built in 1926 uh, by white people for white people. Okay, strictly segregated. You could, you, it would be unimaginable to have this meeting with this kind of open discussion and to have a multiracial audience. Um, and so I think in, in a sense that despite some of the repression that seems to be heading towards us, uh, I mean, Andy Oliver has been able to turn this church into a beacon of hope for so many people. I can't tell you how many times I've been in this sanctuary and. And it's just, it's, 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 it's the best of American democracy. And I think the fact that we can, that, 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 that we can do this should give us hope. And uh, even though we've got a hard road to, to, to travel down, uh, I, I guess, you know, I've spent the last four years writing about John Lewis, who was all about hope. And God knows he had good reasons not to be hopeful. You know? uh, incarcerated 45 times, right? Um, beaten 45 times, miracle, he was alive. And yet he never gave up hope, uh, even, even when he was dying of pancreatic cancer. You know, I mean, uh, the, the day before he went into the hospital for the last time, he dragged himself out to the Black Lives Matter Plaza north of the White House. And, to, and to a bit kind of solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. And it probably just about killed him, but it, it was important to him. And so I think we should all be inspired by that, inspired by this meeting tonight, that, that the spirit of the Civil Rights Act is still alive and well, for a lot of us anyway. Well, I was going to say this would be a, a great segue into our Q&A, but I do want to ask you one more thing, Mr. Arsenal, if we can just get this in in a couple of minutes. After the Civil War and Reconstruction, there was backlash. After a lot of the Civil Rights legislation, there was backlash. After the Civil Rights Act of 1964, what type of backlash did we see then? And is that just a common theme throughout history? Well, it, it does seem for some reason that we go through these cycles, that there'll be a period of progress and uh, particularly on matters of race, I mean, that's kind of the central problem in American history, right? Um, and that, that uh, people get nervous that they're gonna lose power, that someone's gonna take something from them. Uh, I think it's maybe the dark side of a society that's so fluid where you really can't be sure that you're gonna be in the same position for your entire life, right? You can have downward mobility and upward mobility, and that makes Americans nervous. I mean, it's, it's one of the positive things about our society, but it also, I think, makes us anxious and susceptible to what's sometimes called the paranoid style in, in American politics, and I think, so these backlashes happened time and again, uh, but they don't last. I mean, I think that's the thing, that if you think about the civil rights movement, it has worked an incredible revolution in this society. It hasn't solved all the problems by any means, as Bill suggests, it's an incredible amount to do, but um, there are very few societies that have been able to create a kind of nonviolent, like direct action movement where people actually uh, are, are changing the, the heads and minds. You know, the human heart has really been affected. It's not just changes in law. Uh, the public opinion polls show it, despite all the craziness that we're we're challenged with now, all the ugliness. Um, but I think uh, uh, the core of, of American society is, is much healthier than it was 100 years ago, let's say. We really have, have made progress, and I think tonight is, is evidence of that. Thank you so much, and thank you to the panelists for
You want to say one more thing? One more thing. One more thing? Okay. Um, Donald Trump did one, one good thing for the country, in my estimation, and this is it. <laughs> this is it. Donald Trump pulled back all of the pretense, all the pretense, and now what you see is America. This is my point. No more pretending, Betty, no more. Um, and you see now what you're left with. And I think that's a good thing. I do think it's a good thing to know what we are about for real and none of the BS. And I think that's one thing he did. Otherwise, he ain't done nothing, okay? <laughs> Otherwise, nothing. We will take questions from the audience at this point. 